What sets the United States apart from other nations on the earth? Is it the concentration of wealth or the prevalence of poverty, the peace and quiet, or the violence? Perhaps it's all of the above. However, there is something more. What truly distinguishes the US is its unique ability to police the world as it sees fit, regardless of the cost. Is America pushing its democracy to a breaking point by doing so? In this new series from CGTN, we delve into some of America's long-standing issues and their impact on the world. It's a dream among aspiring college students around the world to go to Yale. This elite university is located in the city of New Haven, which has a population of 150,000. However, according to an FBI report in 2019, New Haven's crime rate ranked among the top 6% of cities in the US, and a fourth of its population is living below the poverty line. This parking lot is where carpenter Ernest Pagan's nightmare began. In February 2007, the police arrested him in this building, where he was working. He was charged with shooting one man to death and wounding another outside a bar a month previously. You know, everybody who I was around with, you know, was facing life in prison, you know, serious crime. Anything could happen at any given minute. Pagan insisted that he was innocent. Despite the lack of any direct evidence, such as the weapon used or fingerprints, Pagan was charged with murder and illegal gun possession. If he was found guilty, he could expect a jail sentence of at least 60 years. Pagan needed a lawyer to defend him, but he couldn't afford the tens of thousands of dollars in legal fees. Under American law, a court must appoint a lawyer free of charge for suspects in criminal cases who cannot afford one. This court-appointed lawyer is known as a public defender. However, Pagan had no trust in this free service. My whole community did not trust public defenders. Uh, you don't got to pay a lawyer, you can't win. You know, the public defenders is hired by the state. The prosecutors are hired by the state. They're going to work together, you know, to give you a railroad, to give you some time. In the U.S., public defenders are in short supply. Nationwide, they spend no more than 12 hours on average on a criminal case. In cities with higher crime rates, the time is even less. In New Orleans, Louisiana, it's just seven minutes. And if, if the public defender's office is handling four or 500 felonies per lawyer, uh, it's impossible that all of those cases get adequate representation. Absolutely impossible. Since public defenders are often too busy to gather evidence on behalf of their clients, many criminal cases are resolved through a plea bargain. The prosecuting and defending attorneys haggle, not over the defendant's guilt or innocence, but over the amount of jail time he or she will serve. Plea bargaining is considered efficient because it takes less time and closes more cases. Pagan was not given a public defender. He was kept in a correctional institution for several days, but stubbornly resisted the pressure and refused to plead guilty. This is also rather unusual. They tried for three days to get Mr. Pagan to confess, and he refused to confess. So the fact that he withstood that uh, coercive interrogation would tell Mr. Ullman he might very well be innocent. By insisting on his rights, Pagan made time for evidence of his innocence to build up. It was eventually revealed that the police had deliberately manipulated the testimony against him. After being locked up in prison for over a year, he finally regained his freedom. I'll be sitting in prison with so many other people who are innocent, basically in jail just because, uh, you know, circumstances and police not really caring about justice, but just closing the case. Pagan was both unfortunate and fortunate in that although he was deprived of a year of freedom, 
at least he was exonerated. According to the US Department of Justice, 80% of defendants in state felony cases use court-appointed public defenders because they cannot afford a lawyer, and 80% of these defendants eventually plead guilty and serve time in prison through plea bargaining. This arbitrary detention is quite clearly a major factor in the growth of the number of inmates. The United States has the world's largest prison population and the highest rate of incarceration per capita. With just 5% of the world's population, it has nearly a quarter of the world's prisoners. The situation hits the African-American community particularly hard. Despite constituting only about 10% of the US population, African-Americans make up 30% of prison inmates. With such a massive prison population, incarceration has become a profitable business. Louisiana State Penitentiary, otherwise known as Angola Prison, is the largest jail in the United States. Angola Prison was founded in 1880 on the site of a slave plantation. The prison site covers an area as large as Manhattan, it contains around 6,000 prisoners. Most of them are on death row or serving a life sentence. Four out of every five are African Americans. Strangely, the prisoners who are detained here are required at times to perform for the public. Every weekend in October each year, Angola Prison holds a rodeo. Most of the participating cowboys are inmates. It's open to the general public a ticket costs $20. Angola has the, uh, the longest running and best known prison rodeo in the nation. It is like the Roman gladiators, yes, it is, it is bread and circus. The prisoners who participate in the performance are given a brief taste of freedom. At the same time, the Rodeo brings in millions of dollars for the prison each year. Arthur Reed was once a local gang leader. He served numerous prison terms for attempted murder and drug dealing. Macing, um, beatings, killings, all of this takes place inside of the prison system. So you have individuals that um, recently as, that was beaten to death and his spine was broken, but it was labeled as a suicide by hanging. During his years of incarceration, Reed got used to the prison violence. But what really shocked him was the relationship between prisons and slavery, which he thought had been consigned to history long before. Reed realized that what was happening at Angola prison was a modern form of slavery. In 1865, with the end of the American Civil War, the 13th Amendment was enacted. Although it ostensibly abolished slavery, it contained a major source of ambiguity. The 13th Amendment is one of the greatest kind of trickster acts in the history of our country because the 13th Amendment uh, outlawed slavery but it outlawed slavery with a serious loophole, and that is except in punishment for a crime. So what it did was essentially it legalized slavery in the context of incarceration. In many ways, incarceration replaced slavery. It became an alternative way that was consistent with the Constitution to control black bodies and black labor. Unrelenting work, overbearing guards, and violence all were inherited from the slave plantations and fermented racial hatred. Slavery was never over. It just evolved into an acceptable form to keep black people in the position that they are because someone's benefiting off of it. If no one was benefiting off of it, they would fix it. The potentially huge profits to be made by prisons encouraged the adoption of legislation in the 1980s to allow private ones to operate. According to the Justice Department, the US today has 160 for-profit prisons. My name is Frank Smith and I've been fighting private prisons for 20 years, very successfully. And I do it because I think they're a very uh, 
corrupt industry. What they do gives us more crime problems instead of less. Frank Smith has spent the past 20 years fighting the private prison industry. In that time, however, he has witnessed its rapid growth. The US has more for-profit prisons and inmates than any other country. According to the Justice Department, 96,000 inmates were held in for-profit prisons in 2021. Rick White, a veteran of the Texas criminal justice system, helped Smith to reveal the dark side of private prisons. What we found is that the, the success of the private jails were based upon the ability of the, the company operating the facility to secure contracts from other counties or federal or state uh, facilities to house their prisoners for a price. And that's a very dangerous situation because you have for-profit companies then that exert influence over our government when it comes to our criminal justice policies and practices. The two largest private prison companies in the US are Correctional Corporation of America and the GEO Group. According to the Washington Post, since the 1990s, these two companies have spent $35 million on political campaigns and lobbying to help legislation pass that's designed to ensure that private prisons are kept full. They provide one essential service that our government desperately wants and is willing to pay for, and that is bed space. Private prisons provide excess bed space that allow corrections agencies to incarcerate more people than they physically have room to incarcerate. Private prisons are, I mean, for one, just a glaring and pretty hideous example of the marriage of capitalism and justice. And on the face of it, are flagrantly evil. The combination of capitalism and justice lends itself to exploitation. In 2009, a scandal rocked Lucerne County, Pennsylvania. A former juvenile judge, Mark Chiaverella, and presiding judge, Michael Conahan, were accused of sending more than 2,000 children, guilty of minor offenses, to prison. In return, the two men received kickbacks worth $2.6 million from the prison operator. Local film director, Robert May, spent over a year making a documentary about the scandal. The community thought he was doing a good thing, that he, he was a tough love judge, he had a zeal for zero tolerance, and, and people believed it. I believed it at the time. I thought well, that was a good thing. I got into a fight again, and uh, he was charged with aggravated assault, so he went to state prison. Do you remember me? Do you remember my son? An all-star wrestler? He's gone. He shot his son in the heart. You scumbag! You ruined my life! Ed's case was the worst case example of what happens in the, in the juvenile justice system when someone takes their life. And we know there are a lot of kids that have, um, have been subject to that and have taken their life and left their families in a horrific place. In 2009, a federal grand jury in Pennsylvania found the two judges guilty of racketeering, fraud, and bribery. Two years later, both received lengthy prison sentences. That Judge Chivarella and, and Judge Conahan were taking, actually taking money for each child that was, you know, put away, and that the only reason these kids were going away was specifically because of the exchange of money. The issue of judicial injustice has become an intractable problem in the U.S. The September the 11th attacks in 2001 made the situation even worse. The terrorists declared war on the United States of America, and the Congress must give law enforcement all the tools necessary to protect the American people. In the wake of the September 11th attacks, the U.S. introduced the Patriot Act, 
It allowed the authorities to detain individuals indefinitely if they were deemed a threat to national security. Law enforcement officers were granted virtually unlimited powers to search personal property without permission, break into private houses without a warrant, and make arrests without any justified reason. I'm a New Yorker. I'm a photographer. I use my camera to capture what's going on in my city. I remember one time I was walking with my boy. We're walking towards my house. I hear the hammer from the gun click, right? It's a robbery. So what do I do? Do I run? I turn around, there's a bunch of cops behind me, unannounced with guns drawn. Solveig was terrified of being arrested or even shot by the police on a trumped up charge. But it's not only the human rights of American citizens that can be arbitrarily violated by US law enforcement officers, but also those of people overseas. After the September the 11th attacks, in the name of the war on terror, the US set up so-called black prisons in more than 50 countries and regions where they used torture to extract confessions from illegally detained terror suspects. These included Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq and Bagram prison in Afghanistan. But the prison that has been the object of the most widespread international criticism is the one the US established at Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. The inmates, mostly from the Middle East and Africa, were not charged or sentenced and had no access to lawyers or legal proceedings and no idea when they would ever regain their freedom. Mauritanian citizen Mohamedou Ould Slahi was one of them. The first 70 days, no sleep, 70 days. I was uh, taken away with those people because of my cousin, you know, my cousin who was a friend to the late Osama bin Laden, but he was his friend. He, he never did anything with him. And even if he did, that's none of my problem. I'm just saying so that people understand this. This is a call coming from the United States of America, kidnap this man. And this is like so horrific because even in America, you cannot do that to the people, but you can do that to the people in Africa. You can do, do that people in the Middle East. Middle East. Mohamedou Ould Slahi was detained at Guantanamo for 14 years. In 2005, he wrote about his experiences in prison. Years later, when The Guantanamo Diaries was published, it became an instant bestseller. Slahi says he wants more people to know what is going on at Guantanamo and to be aware of the US government's contempt for human rights. The United States of America is bashing other countries. They don't respect human rights, but they don't respect human rights themselves. You know, like if you are a country who is a friend to the United States of America, you can do whatever you want. There will be no reports, nothing. If you are not a friend of the United States, you are a human rights abuser, you know. And that's a market of human rights because human rights violations are very serious business. No one, no one, no one should be put in prison without due process. No one should be tortured. We all human beings. In September 2021, the UN Committee Against Torture highlighted the issue of the illegal detention and torture at the CIA's overseas black prisons. The UN Human Rights Council's independent panel of experts on human rights called it a stain on the US government's commitment to the rule of law. Clearly, a country that habitually resorts to lies, turns its back on the rule of law and ignores human rights, is doomed to remain a superpower of injustice.